Hey folks, Laura tempest Zakroff here, and I'm joined today by Max, and what we're going to be discussing is the um, online discussion of occult tea. Um, there's four different segments um, exploring witchcraft in the online space, how it affects community, um, hashtag occult tea, um, that was put together by Ella Harrison, the redheaded witch, and Polish folk witch on Instagram. I'm putting this up on YouTube just because it's more comfortable for me to um, do this on my computer rather than my phone because <laughs> I have an old. <laughs> so uh, set this up. We're going to see. Um, probably going to put this all into one video with the four sections and chapter it out so it's easy. The first thing is to introduce myself. So, hi, I'm Laura Tempest. Most people know me as Tempest or LTC, and I am a modern traditional witch. I have been practicing for uh, 30 years at this point. And I am an author. I have written, um, I think at this point we're at 11 or 12 books and decks um, that are out in the world uh, through Llewellyn and Reveler Press. And I am an artist. That's kind of one of my primary things is I'm a visual artist. I'm also a performer. I do ritual, sacred dance, and uh, also part of music groups and, and various sort of things. So uh, I'm a Gemini. <laughs> so I, I do a lot of things um, except sing. Nobody wants me to sing. And uh, so you want to know more about me, you are here on my channel, you can see about dance, you can see about witchcraft, you can see about all of those different things, um, ramblings about art. And um, the for other question that they have for starting things off was, how long have you been participating um, or been in the witchcraft online space? And my foray into the witchcraft online space goes back to the late 90s. <laughs> the mid to late 90s actually, um, so with IRC, um, the Internet Relay Chat, which is sort of the ancestor to Discord in many ways. That's what it feels like to me. Um, but you'd have, you join a server and there would be these channels and you go to channels and you have discussions and um, there's Pagan Tea House and there was other assorted uh, different subgenres and nerds. Lots, lots of geeky, nerdy folks discussing things. Uh, so I was primarily the first space, and then I was on Dracnet, which is one of the early kind of witchcraft pagan servers. That's where my website, the Modern Tradition of Witchcraft website, um, started um, somewhere around there. So it's also the time of GeoCities and Alta Vista and, and Netscape and all of these things. And going like back, can you feel the dust? Here it is. Here's the dust in the cobwebs. Uh, and those old clunky online forums uh, about all of those things. So. I was there, I was present doing doing all sorts of stuff in, in that space and uh, all the way through today. So um, that has been, uh, you do the math, it's been a while. <laughs> and the next question is, what uh, practices and topics do I primarily discuss online? And, you know, I don't, I don't consider myself a content creator. I don't consider myself an influencer. I consider myself a Gemini who is like, I have information. I'm inspired to tell you information. So I'm very much led by what I see in the world around me, what I hear from students and from peers, uh, contemporaries, what I see online and see, ah, there is an issue. How do we resolve this issue? How do we talk about this issue? So. It goes for everything from dealing with deities to art and magic uh, to coven politics and online structures and uh, in person, you know, everything. It, it's a matter of like, what what is the pressing thing? A lot of social justice work as well um, that has been consistent um, for almost 10 years now. So yeah, I'm, I really follow what what my heart uh, tells me and what I'm inspired to see and how I would like to help within the world. Uh, so there's that to start. Now, what is my personal reason or inspiration behind sharing my practice online? My partner like, am I sharing my practice online? I mean, do you want, when I'm talking about things, I'm guessing you are seeing a, my, some of my approach, but at the same time, 
how much are you seeing that's my actual practice? Um, it's kind of a complicated question there. So <laughs> I'm just going to separate my reason for inspiring, being inspired to share information is, yeah, I see a problem. Um, I see I want to help people. Uh, I just really want to talk about topics. Um, whether it's so much of my, it's my personal experience, I guess. We'll put it into to those sort of terms and uh, exploration. Um, but keeping in mind, and I try to remember this with everybody else, is that what we see online is only a small, tiny bit. Um, and people often only pay attention to the flashy bits, um, where there's a whole lot of non-flash <laughs> happening out there. Um, you know, there's a lot of internal dialogue. There's a lot of working out in the world that people don't see. And I don't feel like putting online. So the things I do put online is really about, I see something relev relevant and helpful um, and I share that. So that was question one. I have my questions over here big so I can see them. <laughs> so I'm looking over this way. All right. Um, what am I looking to achieve to seek, um, educate, connect online? Um, you know, my early, the earliest days when I was getting into IRC was I wanted to find other people who thought and believed and were exploring the same topics I was because uh, I grew up two very actually different cultures in a little microcosm when you think about it. I went to Catholic school from kindergarten to freshman year of high school uh, in New Jersey with the same group of people. Um, being of a mixed background also made me a bit of a target. Also being queer made me be a target. Being a neurodiverse made me a target. Um, so I had like one kind of experience um, that I was just like, I don't understand this world I'm in. And then in my sophomore year of high school, we moved to South Carolina, which was a whole other experience. Um, actually very freeing. Um, I highly recommend if you're having a miserable school experience, move to an entirely different school, um, an entirely different state, and uh, reinvent yourself. It's great. Uh, <laughs> saved my life. Seriously. Absolutely saved my life. Um, so I was looking for connection uh, and just being able to talk about these things because I, yeah, I love information. I love sharing it and I love um, meeting people. And some of those people I met in those early days of IRC and then later in live journal and other spaces, I'm still friends with today. Um, even some people I've still haven't even met in person. Like we're still like connected on our things and we know things, intimate things about each other's lives. Um, so that's really, really special. And as it's grown and changed over time, like to be a blogger online and to share more than performances like here on the YouTube space, uh, share my art on Instagram. One of the big things that's happened in the last few years, particularly it started because of the pandemic, is I have a Patreon. Uh, it was mainly for my art, but because we were all so isolated, I started up a weekly Zoom session um, where we meet for about an hour and talk about different topics that are skewed towards witchcraft and magic and things like that. And we're still meeting every week. Um, really formed a, a wonderful community. And I love it. It's like we have people who've been there since the beginning and then we have new people who come and new friendships that are formed, um, new connections. And that's, I think, that's what I love about the internet is being able to connect and meet with people um, and really get to find people from all across the world. Um, so that's, that's really exciting. And I do, I love learning about new things. I love finding new research that's out there. Um, so, you know, to me, it's all about the you know, information and connection and community that, that happens. And I look at the online community as just being as important as the connections that are in the physical space as well. Um, people who dismiss online ritual and workings haven't tried it, haven't really connected in the way because you do a, you do an online ritual with folks and you're all in the right headspace. Shit happens in the most magical sort of way. So I think that uh, what am I looking to achieve? I'm looking at um, connection um, and sharing. And that's what's important to me. Um, how do I believe social media as a whole impacts the community? Oh, that's a thing. So 
in comparison to the 90s and early O's when we were you know, having these discussions and building things online and having a kind of active real-time chats um, and live journal as something that's really long form, right? So people are journaling and talking about their experiences. You really got to know the people that you were talking and chatting with. Uh, and it was really like you're in this platform and you're doing the thing. And now it feels like people are very much fly by, like, I'm going to go leave a comment and skedaddle off into the distance. Uh, <laughs> you never see them again. Uh, I, I'm, I used to do the follow for follow thing early days of the, <laughs> on the internet. Now I don't, um, mainly because, well, when you, you become an author and you get out into the world and everybody keeps adding you and then there's like bots and things. It's like, I don't know. I don't have the time to research every single person. But at the same time, I really wish... I could have a discussion with every single actual person um, who is interested in having um, discussion and sharing and, and kind of being in that same space. And I miss that. I really, really miss that. And I haven't figured out how to achieve that um, in any of the social platforms that are out there. So um, I think that because there isn't a dedicated enough space to really, I think, immerse and learn um, and have empathy for people and compassion and really kind of build that up, that people are at this very fast consume, quick, fast, go, 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 um, you're missing so much. You're missing the context. You're missing the nuance. And that can be really dangerous. Um, it's not just only dangerous in witchcraft. It's dangerous politically. It's dangerous for understanding other people. It's dangerous for health reasons. Like all, it's for all of human existence. We need to slow down. We need to connect. We need to um, not make knee jerk assumptions, like to see one thing and then, you know, spread it everywhere. Because there are plenty of people who claim to be doing stuff that and they're not doing it. There are people who say they're reading things, they're not reading these things. Um, there are people who are only out there to create drama and to have a following or whatever it is, and they don't care about community. They don't care about information and sharing and crafting that. They are more focused on the ego aspect of it. Um, so that affects everybody. It's not just, just witchcraft. But at the same time, social media is amazing for being able to lift up all voices. Like it's accessible. So you can be anywhere as long as you have access to the internet in some way, you can put your voice out there. So that can be really amazing. And that can also be terrible. <laughs> Why not both? Uh, so that I think is really special because there isn't gatekeeping, right? You can't, it's hard to stop people from doing that um, in the worst kind of ways, which is, is good, right? To be able to anybody be like, here's, here I am, here's my path, here's, here's my experiences, let me share them with you. Uh, so as long as we're there to listen and we're interested in a dialogue, it can be extremely powerful and really show people who feel like they might be alone because of what they're experiencing in their home life, in their culture, in their country, wherever they're at, realize that there are other like-minded people out there. And so that can be really, really powerful and really beautiful. So we have that. Um, let's see. How do I think social platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, YouTube impact education and sharing information? Um, they're all different, right? They're all very, very different. I'm, I'm not on TikTok. Um, I've kind of, I hit, I hit my limit on, on adding new platforms. So <laughs> I'm just like, I don't, I don't really think in the video format. That's why you see most of my stuff here unedited. Here it is. Um, very, very minimally, like <laughs> this is going to get pieced together. That is the most amount of editing is going to happen for this. Um, so it's amazing in so many ways that you can get important information out there, but at the same time, you can get a lot of misinformation out there. Um, but it's always been that way. We've always had some sort of media out there that's been really good for sharing ideas and concepts, but also perhaps putting incorrect information out there. So we like to blame whatever the latest thing is, but you can look at issues of you know magazines of pagan magazines back in the day that are full of misinformation and you know that's like 
Oh, that was terrible. That was a terrible thing to share. You know, people who have a, a certain agendas and put those things out there. Um, so it, it's really a matter of was the attention span, was the quality of information. Um, but at the same time, you know, being able to Google what's wrong with my car and then being able to fix it for not a lot of money is great because um, I'm, I'm handy like that. So I found like YouTube is handy for, for that sort of thing. That's where I go to for um, what's wrong with my house now <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, and some of those videos are great and some of them are bullshit, but I look at them all, right? And I use discernment uh, in deciding that. So, you know, they, they can be a starting place, um, but they're no different than any of the other starting places that we've had. And is consuming witchcraft content becoming a substitute for practice? This is nothing new. It's absolutely nothing new. Um, there are always going to be the people who are whatever the discipline, the genre, the craft is, um, who are going to make a big deal, the whole, whole, whole hog in, um, and be like, I have to have all the accoutrements, I have to have all the fancy books, and I have to have all the things so that I can prove that I'm an expert in this particular field. Witchcraft, belly dance, gaming, uh, you know, any kind of thing that, that humans are interested in, you're going to have those people who find, like, this is the way that I can make my personality. This is the way I can describe who I am is to just be immersed in this thing. Um, and they think it's the stuff rather than the emotional, mental, and spiritual journey that's there. So that's always been around. I mean, you can go back, you can go back in time and find it. It's, it's always been true. And those people either realize what things are actually about and then do become grounded practitioners who understand all those things or they go on to the next thing it's always been true so you know people who are all like consumerism and capitalism and witchcraft and like yeah, i know those are future topics we're going to be talking about but i think it's sort of the boogeyman you know it's putting a whole bunch of people you don't even know into a box that isn't even the box it's like why why am i in the box did i ask to be in this box did you ask to be in this box? Are we in the void? I think it's the void. So, you know, there will always be the folks who are like, I spent $600 on this very fancy grimoire and so now I'm a very powerful magician. And there's going to be somebody who's like, I got a crystal and I'm so excited about this crystal and, and I'm going to go do some stuff and then it scared me and so I, I put it away for a while and then 10 years passed and then I found out that I actually am really interested in this thing and now I can give my time and focus and energy to it. I know that it's more than that. So people learn at their own schedules. Right? So this is part one. Let's get ready for part two. Ready? Here we go. Tea time. All right, we're on to part two, which is influencer authenticity. And this chair is creaky. Okay. <laughs> All right, first question is, out of what I share on social media, how much is staged versus reality? I'm pretty much, I am WYSIWYG. <laughs> what you see is what you get. Um, as I said, I don't, I don't edit for, for content. Um, if I see something that inspires me, I share it. That's, that's it. Um, I don't spend a lot of time making fancy setups. The only things that are sort of staged is when I have a new book come out and I have to make a beautiful sort of still life. I make a still life, um, about it, which is just marketing. <laughs> so it's, that's how that is, is, is a beautiful still life, um, for that to, yeah, cause I made a book, me! Um, <laughs> but other than that, um, yeah, I put makeup on. There are occasionally cats. <laughs> if I can command all the cats, if you see all the cats here at once, 
it is not only staged, but it's a miracle. <laughs> because now there are no cats in the room. So, um, yeah, pretty much what you see is what you get. Um, there is also, I guess, the consideration of, like, do I share absolutely everything? And that, again, goes back to I share what inspires me. So it's not staged. It's what inspires me um, and what I feel might be useful for other people. But, like, especially things on Instagram, I just share the images that I'm excited. You don't, my, my Instagram is not curated and pristine to be only one sort of thing you are going to see witchcraft stuff you're going to see my art you're going to see pictures of my cats this is just this is my my slice of life of what i'm interested in and if you're not interested in it tough <laughs> i am um that's this is how i work it starts here it goes out into the world it's just like art i make the art people react to the art in the way that they do so you get what you get so, number two, uh, do I think that there is an element of censorship in online spaces? Uh, how do I decipher what is appropriate to share in online versus keeping it private? And is this based on social media etiquette or personal preference? Those are, those are all great questions. Um, censorship depends on the space, right? The space you're in, the group. And technically you still have the, if you have a working group online, if you have a Discord channel, um, there is a certain community that's happening there. And if it's um, run by somebody, there's a certain set of rules and guidelines that happen. Same thing with Facebook groups. Um, is there censorship? So I guess it's a censorship from above down, um, besides also the social media platforms on what you can share, what's safe for work, what's not safe for work. There's that thing going into there. Um, but then this, I think, goes into the appropriateness of it. Now, um, I use colorful language. Uh, I, uh, I think in general, I also try to think about what I'm saying. So that's a bit of self-censorship, but at the same time, I all of the words come out. Um, so I'm trying to strike a balance between that. As of what keeps private, you know, I, I am sometimes really frank about when I'm going through a hard time or dealing with things. and. Um, I recognize if I'm going through a difficult time, other people might be going through it. Um, so if other people find it TMI, I mean, the weird thing I do, this kind of, I guess it's still on topic, um, is I recently changed the Instagram account. Um, so it shows me a lot more information and to kind of find out like people react really strongly to personal photographs. Sometimes people are like, you know, gets like the most amount of views, but it can also get you the most amount of um, unfollows, um, which, you know, don't really focus on, but I just found it really fascinating. I was like, this is a happy photo that people really like, and a whole bunch of other people left, apparently, according to the algorithm. Um, and that's fascinating. Like, that's, it's not going to stop me from doing what I'm going to post, what I'm going to post. Um, but interesting social experiment. Um, and social media etiquette, personal preference, um, you know, I'm fairly unfiltered for better, or for worse. Um, so you know, always growing, always learning. That's, that's where that is. So the whole Tempest experience. Next question. Have I encountered or heard of grifters in our community? Do I recognize them? Uh, what are significant signs of grifters in the community? Great question. Uh, mm, this is another one. Here, I'm going to settle in. There have always been, as long as there are humans, there are grifters. Uh, and especially within the witchcraft pagan and into New Age, especially once you go into New Age realm, um, there are always people looking to make a buck, looking to prey on people. Um, it's always been kind of dicey, you know, like, and you have to go by your gut on that. Um, of like, but it's like, do I feel the slime? Yes. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I was fascinated by some of the ads that were showing up on one, I think it was Facebook, of uh, somebody who was like, you know, witchcraft or magic for influencers, like attracting the influencers, and you get to take this class for free, the first one, and looking at it, and it's just this mishmash of all sorts of stuff that 
is just, you know, grabbing from all different cultures and there's no cohesive plan and um, it's just, it's super slick, it's super fancy, and then you get into it and you find that it's really like thousands of dollars and I like, I called that out and pointed out a few things about like the big red flags and so we were like, no, no, they're really authentic, they're a real person, they did that and, you know, people got mad at me about it, but I'm like, I'm, time will tell and it did. Surprise, I was right. Hello, hi, I'm Cassandra. <laughs> I've seen this shit and it's going to keep happening. Um, so, you know, people who, I don't want to say because if you have a slick website and it has a certain thing and you're trying to charge money for classes, that that's an instant grift because it's not. I, you, there's nothing wrong with having good, beautiful social media. Um, absolutely should charge for the services that you offer. Um, but being aware of people. I think one of the things that you see is something that doesn't really have a sense of coherency, uh, which an experienced practitioner is going to notice that like these things don't all go together. A newbie's not going to recognize that. Um, there's often a, a whole big push about we're crafting community here. Uh, you know, you're going to be part of the special online coven. You're going to be a star seed, whatever. The, mm. And, you know, like, we're, we're, you're alone and lonely, and so this is going to be your new family, and then it kind of becomes a cult. Um, so there's, there's a particular vibe to that. And that's not saying, like, obviously I've just talked about, like, can create amazing community. Um, but I'm not going to be like, I, I don't put anything out there like I'm selling, I'm going to make, you know, you're going to be part of a community. It's like, no, it happens organically. Um, that sort of thing, and it, it can be kind of rough. So what do you do? Well, follow your gut. Um, something is a lot of money. If it's being marketed, if it's really slick, if it, if all the signs don't add up, then it's probably a grift, right? Um, especially if there's a lot of money involved, and it's like, it, I will do this for you, and, you know, that sort of thing where, like, you're cursed, but, you know, if you pay me $5,000, I will remove the curse kind of stuff. There's that grift. And then we go into the whole thing of um, all the spam accounts on, like, Instagram that are claiming to, uh, you know, be like people like me. I will give you a reading. Grand Rising. Um, the ancestors told me a message. Like, there's that shit going on, too. Um, I'm never going to message you, <laughs> Grand Rising, um, unless I'm joking. Um, your ancestors can tell you your own messages, etc., uh, <laughs> etc. Et so, um, you know, are these people an active part of the community too? I think that's one of the things I notice when these ads and stuff show up is like, well, who is this person? Where did they come from? Um, have, you know, I've been in the community for a very long time. I've been to festivals and events all over the world. Um, read magazines, you know, been in all these sort of discussions and panels, and so I'm fairly familiar with a lot of folks from old timers who've been around. Um, to I try to keep on top of like who's young and upcoming because everybody's important. Um, to know they're all valid; these are all valid points. But if somebody is claiming to be an expert and you know so many years experience, but yet you know. And you don't have to have a book to be valid, right? But you should have some sort of track record there that there is an established community of other people who know and trust you and support you. And it's true, right? If you do good work, people will hear about you. If you have to invent an online persona or kind of create a cobbled together thing, it's, you know, there's some holes in there. So we got that. Uh, what tools are helpful to decipher misinformation and how can we as a community prevent widespread inf misinformation? Oh, this, this is my heart here uh, because as a Gemini and as a neurospicy person, the thing that drives me absolutely fucking insane is misinformation. And as I've gotten older, I've come to terms that people are going to be wrong on the internet. People are not only going to be wrong, they're going to be deliberately wrong. They're going to put deliberate misinformation out there for 
who fucking knows how we you know I don't I don't get it it's not how my brain works um, I can't imagine reading from somebody's book and cherry picking information and then making it sound like it's something else entirely for example like or saying something like spreading rumors and such like oh actually I know why people people do that at least in, in dance community too right it's it's all about like hire me instead look at me instead look at this right that's that kind of energy um, so what I do is instead of trying to go like everybody's wrong right that's you know people have their own viewpoints we're all coming from our own experiences is the best I can do is put out the information that I believe in and try to give people examples and options and consideration and say like here's this you can also check out these resources and I think that's really important as practitioners when we come across something that pulls us up instead of immediately having a knee-jerk reaction to it to settle in and be like what's really going on here am i emotionally reacting to this am i fully understanding the context it's 90 percent of the time people are missing the context they're missing the tone they're missing the nuance and they're just they're pulling from a past trauma or other experience and be like this is that and it's not and then they spread that along and then you get this sort of telephone game so uh what we can do about that take a moment sit with things, read again, listen again, look at those things, check out other sources and see, is there a consistency? Do we find the same pattern over and over again? Or is something an anomaly or doesn't make sense? Or is the same misinformation being repeated in a way that, again, is in conflict with what the general consensus is, right? It's a good way of, of doing that. So, and also do our own research before you put the stuff out there. You know, that's why I have bibliographies in my books is like here's where I got it from please go check that out as well have your interpretation of it uh, and so I'm very much open source in that way that go ahead see what my sources are I'm happy to talk about them um, I'm always happy to learn more information too so that is a big thing and also actually goes back to the grifter thing is grifters especially those who are trying to sell community in such a way often restrict people so that like you can only drink from this source this is the only way you know you're going to be blackballed if you go anywhere else if you know we're the only people who care about you right that sort of vile um what is the word to kind of where are words I need to drink some tea to purposely isolate people um, so that they can't check out the other sources of information. That's a grifter. If someone says you can only get the truth, only, only knowledge, the only resource, this is the best thing. This, you know, it's expensive, but it's worth it. Um, kind of bullshit. So keep that in mind. Okay. Next one is how does a large following impact the perception of the creator? Does this immediately make them an expert or are there assumptions as to why they may have a large following? It's a lot of different stuff going on in there. Um, I mean, I think we tend to assume in social media that um, if somebody has a large following, it must be for a good reason. But again, I've been on the internet a very long time and it's very easy to buy followers. Um, it's very easy to have a viral video that has a few points of truth and then and you get a big following and then after that, nothing. Um, there are people who like come out and have hundreds of thousands of followers and then vanish again um, because they can't handle all the stuff that comes with it too um, of going viral for something. Um, I mean, it definitely helps if people feel that they can connect to you, if you are visually appealing, if you have all the whistles and bells, um, you know, being able to work the media to the best point and advantage uh, can definitely increase a following. And sometimes though, it's just being at the right space at the right time and somebody sharing a thing and suddenly there you are. Um, so I don't really look at anybody's following as whether their content is valid or not, because uh, there are some incredibly people that I know that you can barely find on the internet um, or have a very, very small following, but they will blow your mind. Uh, and then I know there are people who just, you know, 
look the right way and you know people will just get into it and think ah oh, this this because it looks right it ticks all the boxes it must be the right thing um but there's a whole wide range so i don't want to diss anybody for having a, a pretty package and and being appealing and having charisma um because what i also hope is that if you're doing this and you're doing this long enough that you're going to go on a journey and that your path is going to develop and the people who also follow you who are excited are also going to follow and go on their own journey um, and that can be really awesome that can be really really powerful um, i do worry about younger practitioners today who are exposed to so much of this um, because the internet is can is as i say people think that it was like blissful <laughs> wee, uh, back in the day but People are assholes then, people are assholes now, and they're assholes at a greater scale. Um, and so I, it really hurts to see um, young folks who I know who are getting barraged by hateful comments and stalkers and, and all of that kind of stuff. I'm like, that's not fair. Um, it's awful. And people say ignore it, but it's hard to ignore when it's in your face. Um, so that's really damaging and I wish that people had a little bit more understanding and compassion and also not look at everybody as if your media is out here it's for me to take 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 and I can throw my opinions of you at you um, without thinking about there's an actual person behind there so that was a side travel <laughs> all right how does one maintain the um, I can't read my own writing. The balance, <laughs> sorry. The balance of authenticity and content creation. Oh, that's a great, that's a great point. This is something that um, I talk about with contemporary folks, uh, my peers, uh, all their authors and uh, people out there on the, the festival circuit of, who do events and teach and are around is, you know, there's a push, right? There is this feeling that you need to put something out there, put it out there, put the thing out there. And it never goes well. And I feel like I'm really lucky in that I went through hell in my belly dance career. Um, I mean, I still dance now, but like I was in my early 20s when things really hit. So I guess I'm mean, speaking the truth in my last concept to you know be a pioneer of a whole genre and have everybody looking at you and picking you apart and wanting to be your friend but also to backstab you at the same time um really really fucking toxic shit um i managed to survive it and i survived it by turning to basics to turning to a local community i was teaching beginning belly dance in the end of new jersey <laughs> it's in zero um to a wide group of folks. I had like teenagers to grandmoms and just teaching in a gym and finding the love of the dance, again, allowed me to reconnect with what was important to me. And I think that's true. It can be applied to anything. Um, so when it comes to witchcraft, I keep going back to what am I excited about? What is it that I want to share? Um, and I only put that out there. I, I'm not trying to meet, you know, I have to put a quota out. I got to post a thing. I got to do this. I got to do that. Um, you know, I got to have an opinion on anything. I found this whole topic really interesting, the presentation. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, because there's important things to be shared. And I think this is a great way to have the discussion. So that's why I'm involved in this. And so that's the authenticity is here to share information. Um, so if you feel like you're doing something for other people and you're not doing it starting with yourself and your own inspiration, then you're going to be unbalanced and you're going to burn out. So start with you, start what's important to you, start what's important to the people that you care about and follow your inspiration. All right, that's part two. Let's have another sip of tea. All right, now we're on part three, which is imposter syndrome and FOMO, the fear of missing out. Okay. 
First question, when I follow other creators in the community space, does it make me feel inspired and empowered? Or does it make, does it create feelings of feeling of missing out or being less than? So, it's a complicated thing, I think, for a lot of people. But I'm going to answer, obviously, from my own perspective. Um, it depends on the media. Like, I love being inspired. I'm an artist, as I said. Primarily, it's, that's what I do. And artists, we look everywhere for inspiration. So I love to see what other people are doing, what they're creating. Um, and it's really fascinating to see, like, how... I can make something and that inspires somebody else and I see the elements in there and that goes down the line and you know, inspires other people. So that is awesome. Um, fear of missing out. Um, to me, that's more of like when I see my friends are at an event that I wish I could be at, but I can't be two places at once. That's very real. Um, but it doesn't give me a feeling of less than. It's just like, mm -hmm. why can't I buy locate? Why have we not fixed this yet? Uh, so... Uh, mainly, yeah, I mean, the things that I look at and I follow on social media are there to inspire me and to be connected to other people. Um, and when somebody's doing something cool or they're achieving something awesome, especially if it's somebody I know, I'm so happy for them. Um, I love seeing my friends do great things and I love giving other people opportunities to you know, have that space to create and to make a name for themselves too. That is something that I've always done has bit me in the ass, but I still keep doing it because I still believe that it's more important to create opportunities for other people um, because that's how communities made. So yeah, I don't really um, have feelings of, of less than. And if I'm feeling anything disconcerted, it's my own asshole self doing it to me. So I did it to me. I did it to why am I watching me? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. It does in my head though. So if I experience FOMO, has it ever left me feeling vulnerable to be taken advantage of financially or otherwise, such as the need to purchase the latest product or book to fit in? Um, mm, no. Uh, <laughs> I do occasionally look at events. And I'm like, that looks like fun. And at the same time I go, I am not a camper. <laughs> <laughs> the experience looks great the actuality I know what these things are like so I am still going to be wet and soggy and tired and wanting indoor plumbing <laughs> which I know this is a whole different other thing um, again this is relative for my own spirits and my own background uh, and no, if I see something cool and I really like it, yes, I would like it. Um, I also love supporting other artists. Um, so I have a probably now at this point, well, we, my and my partner have an obscene Oracle and Tarot deck collection, mainly because I'm like, it's one more. Um, and that's because anybody else has it. It's because I'm excited to support, you know, this student that I've been mentoring or that friend who's releasing a new deck and I believe in their work. And so, um, that's my financial difficulty. <laughs> it's technically kind of a write off, but you know, it's like to be excited about that. Um, but it, do I feel the need to go out and buy the latest accoutrements? No, unless it's something I think is cool that I want to try out myself. Um, but, uh, and not the, like, I have to find out the latest and greatest thing. Um, because usually, usually I'm kind of the anti-hipster and that sort of like, nope, <laughs> that's good. Let me see how this goes for a while um, and then see how it works out. So that that's where I usually am. I was like, well, that's interesting. Let me watch and see what happens. Oh, okay. And maybe they will try it now. <laughs> so and I've always been that way. I'm just like, scope it out first and see. Um, but I've also... To be really honest, I'm often, when it comes to creative endeavors and such, um, I tend to be the pioneer. So I'm usually the asshole out there being like, let me go try this thing and see what happens for my own, like, my own idea. And then other people are like, oh, I want to do that too. Um, so am I the person starting it? I don't know. I'm just in my own, again, my head being like, oh, I have an idea. Um, let me go do it. And then I'm usually in shock. I'm like, wait, other people want to do this too. So it's the two halves of my personality. The pioneer, who is clueless, and the other one is like, 
Let me watch. <laughs> how, how it just is. This is how I am. So, um, so yeah, no, not, not financially pressured, um, or popularity pressured or such. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> when practicing my craft, do I find myself comparing what I do to what I'm seeing online? Mm, no. No, I'm not going, oh, their altar is much better than my altar. Like, fuck that. <laughs> like, I make the altar that makes me happy. I know what's going on in my work. But again, I've been doing this for so long that I've been through all of the different trials and issues. And you know, there are probably points where I've reached that. And now I'm just out of fox. So <laughs> I gotta do I gotta do what I want, you know, <laughs> and what makes me happy. Um, and again, if I see something that I think is a great idea, I'll be like, oh, let me try that out. But not because it has to match. It's not. It's going to be my own take on it. It's going to be my own flavor, uh, because it's often something my I might have been, been thinking about myself. And it's like ah, it's the zeitgeist of the moment um, that's in there. But it's not a comparison thing. It's more of a, oh, look at the slutty muses. Uh, let's explore this a little bit more. Um, and that's also another thing I'd say is, is part of my personality that's changed over a while is that, you know, I used to initiate and create an idea and then everybody else would copy it. And I'd be like, fuck, and then go on to the next thing. And now I'm like, I'm just going to settle. Like, you can come copy me, copy me, do whatever. You're going to go on to the next thing. Let me just sit and nurture and play with my ideas more, which is... Uh, I've grown, <laughs> hopefully, um, to, to really kind of settle into that too, because it's just exhausting. It's exhausting to be copied. Um, it's just exhausting to be knocked off. Um, at the same time though, it's like, I've recognized the cycle of these things and well, it sucks in some ways and the other ways it's, it's a good, there are good things to it, but that's a whole other discussion. Perhaps we'll have a future discussion about such things. All right. In what ways do I co combat imposter syndrome? Oh, you know, <laughs> is it a new moon? <laughs> I think whatever it's a new moon and the hormones are going in so like I'm doing everything wrong, but it's not a matter of, you know, you know, every, I'm not, I'm not doing the real me. Um, it's just my, my brain being an asshole to myself. Uh, so, uh, doesn't really go into imposter syndrome. Um, I do have this little check in my head and I think this is a healthier part of my, my check, um, is often when I'm going to do something that I'm presenting something, I have a little bit of anxiety about it, like how it's going to go. Like if I'm doing a reading for somebody, like, will it be a good reading? And I think that keeps my brain in a a humble enough place that it's ready and accepting to pick up on what's going on. It's not like I'm doubting who I am, but I just don't automatically assume I know all the things. Uh, and it allows me to be more real and more in the moment than automatically assuming here I am in control of all the things and it's going to be great. Uh, because I think that's a quick way to kind of run into the opposite of imposter syndrome, which is to really be the imposter um, and not know it. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it's complicated. Uh, so what I recommend for, for other folks is ask yourself, is this something I'm excited about? Does this feel right to me? Am I getting something out of this process, this ritual, the spell, the thing I'm doing? Am I feeling satisfied by it? Then you're doing great. And don't worry what other people are doing because other people's experiences are their own. You need to do you. Uh, what would my practice look like without social media uh, influence of other creators? That's a really interesting question. So when I was writing uh, my Pathios blog on a very regular basis, which was like two to three times a week, now it's sort of like once a month, um, I used to feel like I had to talk about whatever was the most current topic, which is a little like this is a little bit like that, but I think this has a bigger breadth of scale and an understanding and deeper space for communication. Um, but there used to be like, oh God, this is the big drama in the community. Everybody's put a post on that. And now I'm like, I've seen it come. I've seen it go. I've seen it come. I've seen it go. 
I've seen it come. Here it is again. I'm not going to write about it. I'm not going to post about it. I'm done. <laughs> Which is um, maybe a bit of apathy there. But <laughs> in that sense, um, my practice is informed by others and more of who am I directly working with and what are their needs. So if somebody comes to me and says, I need this particular accessibility in ritual that hasn't been present or didn't work out well, that's how I alter and change my practice um, to be more inclusive in that sort of way. Um, so that is important and that affects my practice. So that's going to happen whether that's in person or on social media because it, I have different, I have online community and I have in-person community. So it's hard to separate them out because if somebody's having an issue in person, right, somebody online is also likely having that issue too. And then again, the zeitgeist of the moment tends to happen. But um, it's not going to change my practice if there's no social media out there. It is going to make me sad because I don't get to see, you know, what people are creating and having fun with and what my friends are up to and what are the new people that I'm excited to meet and discover. Um, so that new information is coming out there because we should always be learning and growing. Right. And I think that's the end of this section. I think there's a conclusion. So let's see. So I was wrong. <laughs> that's number four before we get to the conclusion. Uh, and it's another juicy one. It is the capitalizing off community, which um, I teach a class on business of witchcraft. So like let's talk about these things so <clears throat> do i consider online communities equally valid to in-person communities yes uh, as i said in the very beginning my first real communities i was finding were online um, and then i was able to find in person and it's because of those online resources that i was able to find in-person things and being able to be in touch with people that i don't live in the same space as like different states, different countries, priceless. It's, it's important. Um, and so I've been now going on four years with my Patreon community of you know, meeting almost every week when possible. Um, and we do rituals, we have discussions, we know things about each other. Um, family, that's why I don't rec record them. I only record rituals so that people can't be there that evening, can still participate. Um, but when people are sharing their own private stories and backgrounds and being vulnerable, um, I don't want that recorded for anybody. <clears throat> but side story. So um, I do believe that online communities are equally valid to in-person communities, but they are totally also different experiences. And I think it's very easy to be in one and the other and realize that you know, have a foggy idea of what the other ones are like. Like if you only exist online, then everything seems very fast and moving really quickly. And you can miss out on those interpersonal connections that really building that depth of, of relationship, um, depending on the social media, as I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and there's an idea of like, if you're in person that everything online is just nonsense. Like, you know, there were so many things that happened at the beginning of the pandem pandemic where people are like, well, we're not going to even bother meeting online because it's just not worth it. You can't do ritual online. And like, connection. Connection is important. I and mean, here you are doing a ritual, pulling in elements and deities and things you cannot see in the, in the ether. And you don't believe we can connect in different places and still share the energy? bullshit uh so it's powerful there are different experiences and i still feel like nothing quite beats having an amazing in-person experience but i would never discount the online experiences i've had were informing those communities um because they've gotten me where i am today and i'm so thankful for all the people i've met along the way so they're both um both very valid very important um especially to different people of different parts of their path uh, have how have online occult slash witchcraft communities um, impacted me as a person and a practitioner? Well, I think I just kind of answered that. Um, 
But, you know, here's, a, here's another little more modern example. I talk about, you know, back in the 90s um, and having websites and getting information out there for people. But, you know, one of the funny things was um, reading and meeting you know, online some people like around when I was kind of coming back. So a little, little bit of a nugget is around 2011, 2012, I blew up my entire life, which was I... I got divorced from being in a 15-year abusive marriage. I moved across the country. I quit my job. Um, started a new relationship. All all of those things happened. Um, and part of that was being able for me to really immerse myself back um, a little bit more publicly in my practice because I had withdrawn my practice because of the situation I was in. Um, it was, was very much me and my own thing, and I didn't want it to be belittled and, you know, dealing with all the other issues I was dealing with. And so when I was in a safe place, I was able to reimmerse myself in the community and to talk about these things and share these things. And so I started blogging about that, and my blogs caught the attention. Oh, I met Jason Mankey in person at Many Gods West and he's like, well, you're like to write for Pathios or so, somewhere around the same thing. I can't quite remember if it happened first or about the same time. Uh, but Jason can correct me on that. <laughs> if he remembers either because it's all sorts of little blur. Um, and, but that's how I started blogging on Pathios and then met another whole circle of group of people who I absolutely love and adore and some people I don't. So, you know, when some you lose some. <laughs> And, um, but like the people who are in my life, um, because of those experiences, those online experiences, um, have just enriched my life so much more. And they are part of my in-person practice, um, when I get to be with them in person too. So I really, really treasure that. And again, I don't discount anything. I, have. I think everything is woven. We are weaving the luminal. Product placement. <laughs> What are some of the dangers of the current phenomenon of capitalizing off the witchcraft community? All right, so this is a spicy topic and I want to kind of set some groundwork here um, and things I've talked about before. If you, if you are new to my channel, you can go back and read, read, watch. Um, we're about talking about the business of witchcraft. Um, but it's really important to realize that we have a few different levels of things going on here. First, within the pagan occult witchcraft community, people tend to have an unhealthy relationship with money, um, mainly coming from a other sort of background um, where, you know, when you're thinking about the clergy, the clergy are already taken care of by a church or a temple or etc. Um, there's also the sort of thing that's been going through the craft since Gardner, you know, who is well off on his own, <laughs> excuse me. Sorry, Gerald, but it's true um, that, you know, shouldn't charge money for the craft. You've got that. Um, everything that we do is an energy exchange. So it's up to us to decide how we exchange that energy for time and effort, um, whether in giving you an experience, you know, a performance, a book, artwork, right? What is that worth back and forth? And unfortunately, we can't barter. Um, so essentially what we're looking at in today's side is often a form of commerce or some sort of energy exchange, right? That's what's happening. Um, once we get into a point where we're profiting off of people unfairly, um, it gets into the danger of capitalism in the way that, you know, there's some, I'm not going to say that capitalism is great because we are in late stage, fucked up capitalism. Um, but proper business models that making sure that everybody's taken care of both at both ends of the relationship important um but there are predatory relationships out there and there are definitely people who um see something and go ah that's hot i'm going to put a product out there that capitalizes on that thing right so you can consider the ai books that are on amazon right now um that you know, marie silva Mary Silva, who is not a real person, um, and people were debating that back and forth, but I remember when they first appeared, I saw their photo, I reversed engined, tin eyed their photo, and it was a stock photo. Um, not a real person, right? Um, people who are real in the community don't need to use a stock photo um, from a, you know, Adobe stock website for their author photo, right? So not a real person there, um, starting that, and it's mainly 
regurgitated, you know, hot topics that is stolen and collected from other books and put through a processor. So that is a, ooh, look, that's hot. You know, so let's make money off of it. And at some point it's going to get to a pressure point and hopefully burst um, because it's bullshit. So that's that's dangerous because one, you are stealing content from actual, you know, people who so, you know, really put their effort into it. You know, the publishers, the writers, the authors, the artisans, etc. Um, it's being put together in a way that doesn't make sense. If you, I found a AI summary of one of my books that has information that is not in the book, like whole situations and scenarios that are not in the book. Like this is nonsense. Like it, it has flowery language and then stuff that doesn't exist. Um, so it's putting false information out there. It can put really dangerous information out there. Um, you're thinking about the, the foraging books for mushrooms, like there's, you know, things that are life threatening that you don't fuck around with. Um, so that's dangerous. Um, it can also put out poor quality things in general. Um, I know folks are like, oh, look at how much those tarot decks are going for on you know, Kickstarter. So I'm just going to put a tarot deck together and, you know, just throw some art in there. Like, no, a really good quality Oracle tarot deck is going to have consideration and thought. It's not just throwing art and a word on top of it. It's bringing those things together. So that's a danger, right? That's That's a lessening of it. Um, when people go, oh, well, you know, things are hot and there's so many, you know, so many beginner books and whatever out there. Yeah, that, that also concerns me when, you know, the bigger publishers, like, we <laughs> clear up one thing here if you're new to this world. Um, publishers like Wiser and Llewellyn and Moon Books, etc., are typically small publishers. They are big publishers, but, uh, and Cross Crow, that's a newer one, too. There's, they might have you know a nice selection of titles, but they're still small compared to like Simon and Schuster and Penguin and then the bigger ones out there who go, oh look, that topic's hot. They're gonna throw some money at somebody who often has a lot of followers to put a book out there, and they're only they're not gonna put sustaining effort into it. They're gonna make a big hot splash usually around October, and then it's gone. Um, which I don't think does any service to the author or the artist or anybody there and nor really to the community because it's really just like here's a tasty piece of cake but you're not going to have any you know actual protein or you know things the substance to back it up that we're going to really support right we're just going to collect the money and go right meanwhile those smaller publishers that are big publishers within the community they are <laughs> their teams, those folks, the editors, the, the people working in the warehouses, they are part of our community. They know what's going on. They're listening, they're hearing, they're creating feedback, they're doing a thing. Um, so, you know, people like to, to diss our smaller publishers and I guess they'll dismiss them as big, but they are part of our community and they are active in our community and they do care about the community. Um, they also have to look at the bottom line. So, you know, some things that are, are on the far scale of being esoteric are best done, you know, if you really want to get out there, self-publish. So um, there, there's difficulties in all of that. So there's that, there's, you know, so the biggest thing is that misinformation of, you know, poor quality stuff getting out there, especially when it's being uh, off the backs of other people um, who made good quality content and it's being hashed and taken apart and obliterate it for somebody to make a quick buck on there. Um, and that means that people are getting less than stellar information, um, you know, and it's not really supporting creating community in there. It's, you know, it's not even a real person in there or it's not somebody who's ever going to be a part of the community. They just saw an opportunity for that. That really sucks. But, you know, how often is that happening? Well, AI stuff, it's happening a lot. But in terms of actual people, eh, you know, and it doesn't mean that every person is going to be super active at every festival event type of thing either. Um, some folks are, you know, very reclusive and they put something out that's amazing and then they go back into their little cave. Um, but they still are consistently doing that and they care about what they're creating, even if they, for their own personal needs, pull back. So I'm going to take a sip. Marty. How have, have I been personally affected by this or have witnessed somebody else be affected by this? Um, 
so in terms of the knockoff sort of stuff, um, at least one of my Oracle decks has been knocked off um, and being sold for uber cheap. Um, it's a lesser quality. Um, so, you know, that's the thing where somebody doesn't really care about the artist, the author, the team creating it, supporting a local community, and just puts out cheap knockoff out there. Um, it's happening to books. Um, it's happening to all sorts of artistry, right? We have like Wish and Timu and things like that happening. Um, and it hurts. It hurts your independent creators. It hurts your authors. It hurts your artists. It hurts the people who are contributing actively to the community uh, because we don't make a lot of money doing this. Uh, we do, yes, we're like, we do it for the love, so it shouldn't matter. It's like, fuck you. <laughs> You know, do you want to feed my cats? My cats, you say, if you saw Max in the beginning, Max is very hungry. Max likes his food. If we don't feed Max, then he might eat me. <laughs> right, very right. Um, and also being part of a local community, I also do see folks who are very confused, you know, they pick up some book or something that they're, and they're like, I just am really more confused about this. This is really what witchcraft is all about. But luckily they are able to find a real shop or a real group and find that there's more information out there and find those resources. I just wish there was less junk in that respect um, so that there is enough room. Like, because I'm not going to be the person to say, there's too many beginner books out there because I find like when people say that, I'm like, okay, so what is the one beginner book that you would recommend? And most people are like, mm -hmm. like if you don't have something that you feel is tagging, you know, all those boxes that is appropriate for today, then there's still room. There's always room for a new voice, a new take on things and material needs to be updated. So there's that. Um, so let's see next. Should there be paywall communities and online courses? So I'm in, you've mentioned my Patreon. I'm really not bringing it up just to bring it up, but um, it it's behind technically a paywall, um, mainly because there's a lot of things that's behind the scenes that, you know, that's the exclusive content is you get to see how I draw stuff. You get to you know, see me ramble about things um, that, you know, apparently people are interested in, but I'm not going to put that everywhere. Um, but I also make it really accessible. Like you can attend our weekly meetings, gatherings, <laughs> sessions, whatever, our weekly chaotic uh, community crash course uh, for a dollar, you know, a dollar a month. So the, the level of getting into that is very, very simple. Um, and I think it's, it is important when you are trying to craft community of what, if we're putting something together, you want people who are dedicated to that um, and are putting that energy into it. And unfortunately, that does often mean that there is some sort of cost involved. With my online courses, um, so I've been teaching um, virtually since the pandemic started, and I've also offered those on a sliding scale. So there's the opportunity to have your general price. There is a student income price or income affected price. There's a benefactor if you want to help out other people. And then I would do scholarships. And I've mentioned this before too, is that the funny thing about offering scholarships is that more like at least more than 50% of the time, the people that I would award a scholarship to don't show up. And we see that in in-person classes too. When you offer something for free, people take it for granted. If you just charge five or $10, people show up. Um, and so that goes into another part of like, this is not a question, but it's like, what do people value? If you make some sort of sacrifice, even if it's a small monetary sacrifice, you're putting that effort in, you get a commitment to it. Um, I really wish it wasn't that way, but until we figure out a different system of how our brains work when it comes to finances, money, and community. Um, I still try to make it, again, as accessible as I can be. Um, and, you know, and there are people, again, I'm not saying like it's happened every time, but for most, a, a lot of the time, um, if you're like, well, you know, there's situations, like, I know there's all this extenuating situations that if you're in there, um, but 
unfortunately, I've had more than enough proof to see it in a variety of different ways that um, and a little bit of financial investment often changes how people are viewing the material that they're receiving, which goes back to the energy exchange. If you're giving something, you value it more. And how does one ensure the authenticity of courses, workshops, memberships as a financial investment? Uh, that's a tough one. You know, as I mentioned in the previous segment, you know, you've got grifters, you got people putting things out there. The best thing you can do is if you're interested in a class or workshop or a course is see what other people are saying. Um, look at what other work that person has done and have they been around for a while? Do they have books? Do they have other bodies of work that you can look at that says, ah, this is something I connect with. This is something I want to learn more about. Um, and there are people who are excited to keep doing this again and again. So that's the best way you can do it. Um, and I think that for those of us who teach, um, who truly love teaching and sharing information is that you will see a variety of accessibility uh, in there, but there's also a reservedness to it. Like I'm not offering everything all the time, right? I'm preserving my energy. Um, I'm, you know, so I'm not teaching as many virtual classes now as I was in the height of the pandemic because I'm also doing in-person stuff too, but I still care about the online community and making certain of things available, but I have to take care of myself. So it's a balance in there. So looking for somebody who, you know, what they're offering, what kind of schedule are they offering it? How much are they offering? Is it in person? Is it live recorded? Is it virtual? Is it just something that, you know, it's already been pre-recorded and you're just buying a course that, you know, was recorded 10 years ago. Um, these are things to, to ask. You have to do research. You have to use discernment. <laughs> this is a big D word. Use discernment. Use your brain. Use your critical thinking skills. And if you don't have a good feeling about it, also you use your gut intuition um, and, and see about that. All right, now I believe we're getting to the conclusion. So let's do that. All right, we've reached the conclusion, which has a lot of questions in it too. All right, so let's get through this. Uh, what are some topics of conversation I'd like to see more of in our community? I think I brought a few of those up already throughout my answers. Um, Really, I think we want, I want to see more discussion about bridging the gaps between different communities, um, different age groups, um, because everybody has something to offer. Um, and we tend to have, a, again, a knee-jerk reaction that, oh, those people over here, those people, this, that, and the other thing, when we're like, we're all going through the same stuff. So how do we bring that conversation to the table? Um, and how do we make it more inclusive for a wide variety of genders and ages and backgrounds, um, levels of experience, right? Inclusivity um, that honors everybody as much as possible. So we've got that. What are my community needs? Um, my community needs are satisfied. <laughs> um, what I look forward to in community is that I am able to offer and share what I feel is important and see other people learn and grow from that, but also to have that peer review and discussion um, that I can bounce my ideas off of so that I am constantly growing. Um, and I'm doing, I have to say, I'm doing a pretty good job. I'm really kind of happy of where I am in both my in-person and online community. I feel, I feel blessed. So that's, that's what I'm looking for is that diver, diverse verse, di, bleh, words are hard, diverse voices um, and uh, having learning and sharing happening at different ends of the spectrum so that it's stimulating and inspiring. Uh, where would I like to feel more held and supported? Oh. This, I guess this can go into another topic, right? Another op things, which is actually the last thing on the list too, is what other topics. Um, so being a femme presenting person, 
Um, I have been dealing with shit for three decades of being dismissed. Um, people make instant assumptions about my name, about my publisher. Um, they make criticisms of me or my also my peers who are on that same level um, that they wouldn't make of straight white men um, or just white men in general. Um, and that is bullshit, right? Um, I often joke that I'm going to release a book um, under like some totally made up dude bro name um, with a spooky cover and it's pretty much going to be what I write but in a spooky cover with a different name just to see what happens because um, you know there's a lot of misogyny there's a lot of internalized misogyny um, that happens that women aren't honoring themselves um, and you know I'm technically I consider myself gender fluid as well, but because I'm, you know, assigned a female at birth and just, you know, have certain baggage that comes along with that. Um, and yeah, and I try not to impress that upon other young women who are coming up in the community as well as young binary, non-binary people. Um, because yeah, people want to say like, oh, you're only this or you're that, or your opinion is only worth that, um, you know, I'm told I have to tone it down. Um, I'm told that I'm bragging if I actually like barely state what my accomplishments are, and but it's okay for you know do bro for, you know brother Joe over there to like here's my list of all the things in my 34 degrees and blah 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 and I fucked all these people like I just want to give you a little bit of background. Let me go to the next thing. So um, you know I think we can do we can do better. We can do better, uh, and it's not just for me and my sake. As I say, I've weathered a lot, um, but it's still very, very much present in the online community and the and and the in person community. So, yeah, talk about the feminine vine. Why don't you actually honor it, um, as well as the you know outside of the gender binary? Because fuck the gender binary. <clears throat> so there's that. Uh, where do I feel like I'm um, not being seen in my community? I guess those are kind of in the same things too, right? Um, <laughs> where am I not being seen? Um, oh, you know, you're not a guy, so your opinions on sigils apparently is just fantasy or, you know, not, not worthy. Or you need to, you know, have a whole bunch of guys' opinions on your work first before it can be considered valued. <laughs> like, I've been there, done that. Um, so let's stop looking at people. Oh, you're young and pretty. You must be an idiot. Like, stop. Stop with that stuff. Because um, I do see all of the beautiful young people out there. Um, and you're more than just your face. Um, you're here too. So I just want to, I don't want to hug. I want to hug all of you. Um, and I know that you are more than, than your appearance. So... Her comment here. How can we help each other in removing the external peer pressures and grow and grow in community? I mean, how do we human? How do we how do we be better human beings? Um, this is a collaboration. It's not a competition. Let's put it that way. All right. So if we listen and we open up communication, and again, truly listening, not just speaking out, but to, to hear. I hear you. Um, I think we are less likely to see each other as competition um, and comparing to each other. And, you know, comparison is a thief of joy. Um, I should be able to revel in what we're, what we celebrate together and what our differences are. How can we as community better in receiving criticism and feedback? Um, I think it's about understanding what criticism and feedback is and how to give it. Uh, Probably one of the few things I credit to my RISD education is having survived many eight hour long critiques. And if you have survived many eight hour long critiques, um, then you know first how to receive criticism as well as how to give it. And it's a constructive criticism, which is this is working, this is not working. Have you thought about doing this? Right. So when you see a painting, you're like, oh, I really like the colors in here. But did you think about maybe shifting this perspective there because it would draw you in in that way? The same thing can happen in a witchcraft circles. People are like, you're doing it wrong. 
but don't offer a way to do it right or offer why, you know, well, I do it this way and this is the result I get. Again, communication, conversation, that dialogue needs to happen. Uh, and I think if we listen to the context, so like, hey, here is my painting. This is why I created it. And be like, oh, now I understand why you used red. Oh, I understand why you brought in this incense for that. Like, whatever it is, we have to listen. We need to be able to see what's going right and then use our own experience as a way to suggest, oh, you know, uh, other opportunities if we feel like somebody's doing it wrong. But, you know, doing it wrong is not the same as doing it differently because there are many ways to achieve a similar result that doesn't have to follow the same little trail of breadcrumbs, right? So, um, who are some community members that I look up to that are reliable uh, resources and inspirations? Uh, here's some, I'm gonna go try to keep it to a living, um, living community members. Um, one of the people that comes right to the top of my head is Evo Dominguez Jr. Uh, Evo is, just a wonderful resource, um, written many books, is a community leader, Assembly of the Sacred Will, um, kind of behind the whole New Alexandrian Library. Um, just, I love Evo so much. I think mean, it was the Evo fan, fan girl, boy moment. I love you, Evo. Uh, <laughs> I was really, really honored that he wrote the introduction for We the Liminal, and I got to co-author Gemini Witch with him, which is like, again, the Verklempt is coming. Um, who else? Who else? Oh god, there's so, there are so many. Like, I feel like I want to name all of my, my peers and, like, co-authors and folks so, um, that, you know, I just am super fangirl over because uh, <laughs> I love to see what everybody's doing and I feel like I'm going to, like, fill it up with all my friends and people are like, see, it's just all your friends. <laughs> like, but yeah, because if I really like somebody, I'm like, hi, I like you. I want to. I want to be your friend. Um, so you just need to to take a look at like you know other things that are are going on out there. Um, and you know, there's so many young uh, folks who are coming up too that I'm just excited to see. So I'm just gonna single out Evo there, and you can sell me lyrics right now. My brain's like, I see a sea of faces, and um, if I felt like I started on that, I'm going to like leave somebody out and someone's going to be mad at me. Don't be mad at me. I love you all. Okay. Other things I would talk about. Well, um, other subjects. So yeah, how can we be more inclusive? How do we understand giving feedback um, more appropriately? What is feedback? What is criticism? Um, how are we building community? Right? How is community built? I think that's a great topic too. And um, all right, I'm going to wrap it up because this is long. So, uh, again, thank you to uh, the Polish Folk Witch and the Red-Headed Witch and Ella um, for putting this out there and um, starting off this, this dialogue, this discussion. I really appreciate it and looking forward to seeing other responses from, from folks. And if you have questions about anything I've said, you know, put them, put them in the comments below. Um, and thank you for being here and for listening. All right. Cheers.